Hello and welcome to News Click for another edition of our discussions on COVID-19. There is no question that COVID-19 is not going away. In fact, those who have been talking about herd immunity and such scenarios, they seem to forget that herd immunity has been achieved only when we have had a vaccine. Otherwise, against no infectious disease has herd immunity really worked. And the same scenario we see here today, we may talk about Sweden and so on, but let's look at the countries which have been affected. And we have the uh, daily figures that the, for instance, the Worldometer site provides and various other sites provide. If you see that, you will see those countries who were at the top of the numbers earlier, for instance, you have had US, India, France, Italy, UK, Germany, they are again still at the top. So therefore, if we think that herd immunity, at least in countries like France, Italy, they should have give, given us some, given them, Italians, the French people, some protection, it hasn't worked. And in fact, the details of it are very clear that it is the number of people who are affected in certain parts of these countries the same places are affected by the disease, by the epidemic again. So clearly, it is not that the herd immunity has been reached in these places, but if infection still stayed, people in, who are infected in these places still, and again, under certain conditions, maybe lifting of the lockdowns, normalcy being considered uh, to be restored, that again, it has spread. In India, it's very clear. Delhi is in the third phase. We had the, this is the third crest that we are seeing. We had one wave earlier. We have a second surge, and Delhi is now seeing a third surge. And if we take all of these surges into account, the point is that they have taken place in different parts of the city, maybe, but the same city has been affected again, again, and again. So if we think that herd immunity will actually protect the people after some time, that rate of protection would demand 60 to 70% of the people be infected. And we are nowhere near reaching those figures in any part of the world, including the United States, which has the highest rate, highest numbers as of date, and is also breaking all records. They're going 100,000 per day, more than 100,000 per day. In India's figures at the moment have receded from the 90,000 at its peak to about 40, 45,000 right now. But none of these figures should be taken at face value. All it means is that the nonlinear nature of the epidemic, that it goes from one place to another, one locality to another. And as one of the epidemiologists in the country have described it, it's really hundreds of epidemics which we are seeing. We may total them as one epidemic when it comes to countries' figures, but there really are a number of epidemics which are taking place simultaneously. And that's why herd immunity means 60 to 70 percent people, and that is not being achieved in any part of the country as yet, if it ever will. And we'll come to that. Why am I saying that? The second part of it, we have hard data, seropositivity data, which looks at how much how many people have antibodies, what fraction of the people have antibodies. And if you take Indian figures, it's about 15, 16% in, say, a city like Delhi. If we take other parts, it's not very different in different parts of the world. If we take specific localities, it, of course, differs. Dharabi has something like 60% herd, 60% uh, seropositivity. That means people have antibodies in them. And therefore, they are unlikely to fall ill again. 40% may not have uh, antibodies, but because 60% people have, the number of infections have come down dramatically over there. But in other parts of the city, they're there. And what we discussed with Professor Rath the other day, he described to us, for instance, seropositivity figures in Pune, that you have Jugijopi clusters, which have high seropositivity. That means infections are high. We expect it because it's a, a densely populated center the shared bathrooms, and also the fact that they have much less space per, per person. Therefore, obviously, the infection rate is higher. Just opposite that, or close to that, you have apartment buildings where the rates are lower. But that also means that those buildings could also get affected tomorrow, which they indeed are. 
And that's why you have this surge one after another in Delhi, Pune, in other places. Coming back to the other issue of uh, what is called the herd immunity issue, and I see articles now coming up in different places. The herd immunity article is also presented as if, if we have an infection of COVID-19, then that is it. We SARS-CoV-2 has infected us, we'll have antibodies for the rest of our life. We know that's not true. We know that at the moment, we do not know how long the antibodies will last, but we have also had cases of multiple infections, very small, but nevertheless, we had cases of a second time COVID-19 infection. That, that is something we also need to take into account. How long will this infect antibodies last? How long will they protect us? We know in the case of flu, every year we need flu shots. And even then, they're about 50, 60, 70% effective, depending on the year. But so in this particular case, if we get the vaccine, how effective it will be, at least initially, we don't know. How long the vaccine effect will stay, six months, one year, three months, we do not know. These are all unknowns at the moment. So to talk about herd immunity and let everything else go, in fact, is basically either fatalism, that means, okay, we can't do anything about it, let it go. Whatever happens, happens. Or it is basically saying that survival of the fittest and they will take the hindmost. This is the only perspective with which you can talk about herd immunity as a principle, because we know there is no herd, herd immunity that is that's likely to be achieved. And all those who are talking about herd immunity essentially are arguing for going back to quote unquote normalcy, lifting the all the restrictions that exist and hoping that let it rip through the population, but at least the economy will be, will be restored, that we'll get normal economic life back again. But the point is, we have seen time and again, irrespective of what the government policies may be, people are not going out in large numbers. They still maintain their distances. They're still, still taking precautions. And therefore, a normal rest restoration of the economy will not take place unless people are able to do, the governments are able to do, or countries are able to do, or China has done. Not only China, it's also been done by Vietnam. It's also been done by, for instance, Taiwan. So there are other places in the world who have actually crushed the disease, crushed the epidemic completely, and they have gone back to normalcy, and there is a restoration of economic life there. But look at what they do. For instance, if they find, like the Kashgar, which is actually a part of what is the Uyghur, campaign which keeps on talking about how China has created this uh, Uyghur uh, concentration camps without, with very little data. But leaving that out, in Kashgar, for instance, when some cases were detected, they tested the whole city. And then they, decided, they found that about 140 odd cases were there. And that's how they crushed the pandemic in Kashgar. Similarly, any place, Wuhan, they were having multiple cases coming up in the city and you know, at odd times, odd places were showing people having symptoms or showing positive uh, COVID-19 cases. What they did is at, at one point, they tested the entire city. They took three days, tested 10 million people and found about 150, 160 people. And that's how they crushed the epidemic. Now that kind of approach, crushed the epidemic in order to restore the economy will work. But if we think a mixture of laissez-faire, let it rip, let the people be infected. Then we are not understanding the reality. People are taking precautions. People are being careful. And that's why this policy will not work if the epidemic continues. And the epidemic is continuing in various countries, as we have noted. Some countries, no, most countries in various forms. But certainly in countries which have been affected earlier, is we are again seeing surges coming back. That means it's very much there. It's a, basically the nature of the epidemic that it waxes and wanes in certain parts and comes back again. The last point I would like to make that let's recognize the public health issue. And what are the public health implications? People will die. That means COVID-19 has already become the biggest killer in the United States. It's not the biggest killer in India, partly because our demography shows by much younger population. 
death rates are therefore relatively less. Plus the COVID-19 cases as they have occurred, we have also, the health system has, has better understanding of how to treat serious patients. Therefore, the death rates all over the world in COVID-19 have fallen from the initial phase. But having said that, what do we see in Delhi today? For instance, already there are hospitals are chock and block full, the COVID wards are getting full, and most important, the basic requirement that you have of oxygen and ventilators, if there are serious cases, those beds are now becoming to be completely full. So this is the issue, that if you want to face it, you, as a public health disaster, public health issue, you have to prepare your hospital system to take care of the peaks and you have to manage those peaks. That unfortunately is a public health issue, which we at the moment do not see how governments are facing up to this. And certainly in India, we have, in spite of the fact that we have had warnings, we know the peaks can come. The Delhi peak is probably, maybe, it's, it can grow up to 10,000 from 7,000 odd it is now seeing. Are we prepared for that? That is the preparation we need to have, and not just talk about so-called mythical herd immunity. So these are some of the issues we need to take because the vaccine is still going to be at least another six months away. Let's face it, that we are not going to see the active vaccine campaigns all over the country reaching at least 20, 25% of the people for another six months to nine months, whatever the government may say. Unfortunately, the government has taken a completely political approach to the uh, COVID-19 issue. First, making a lot of song and dance about lockdown, being able to crush the epidemic, then saying we are now talking about avoiding deaths, that we have avoided so many deaths, therefore it's a victory. Now saying this, this epidemic is going to go away by February. We know that the predictions of the DST supermodel was that by February, not only will the Indian numbers fall or almost disappear, but also Delhi would start falling after the second surge that we have seen, predicting that Delhi is now going to only fall. What do we see? Delhi has actually seen a third peak, bigger peak than what were the earlier two peaks. It had predicted the DST supermodel, not talking about something which is non-government. This is a government model. Government has put its imprimatur on it by calling it the DST supermodel. That model said that Delhi's figures are probably such that, not only Delhi's figures, in fact said all over India, the figures are such that we have reached 30% seropositivity in the country, which means that Delhi had much higher number of infections that this is figures would be even higher. What do we see? No, this is not true. Obviously, the seropositivity levels are what the figures which the ICMR surveys are releasing are that it's really 14, 15%, not 30%. I would also like to advise all those who are talking about uh, the so-called herd immunity and so on, they're forgetting one thing. Okay, people are not dying in the numbers that they were dying earlier, that's true. Because as I said, our demography is such that we have a much younger demography, the older people are affected more. But there is another issue to this, that even the younger people, there is something called long COVID. That means 10 to 15% of the people take a long time to recover. It affects different organs of the body. This is not a disease. This is not something that we have to take it as if it is just for them a five day, four day, six day issue, and then it goes away. Yes, for 80, 85% of the people that may be true, but 15%, it is something which is a large number considering the number of people we are seeing, and therefore we should not forget this number. This is something which we have to take into cognizance that there are cases of long COVID, which are not small, which are significant in number, and those people are going to pay a very heavy price if we do not, we repeat, if we do not try and control the disease. Right now, the government seems to have given up. The people have developed a fatalistic approach, and therefore we have a failure on a large scale for the public health system. And therefore, we are getting the DST supermodel, 
talking about how everything is hunky dory, everything is going to be fine. When it is not, we start seeing talks about herd immunity. And I think both of these are and underestimating the seriousness of the problem that we still have. And this is something we need to understand. The public health crisis is there. COVID-19 is a public health crisis. And we have to still tackle public health crisis through public health systems that we have. That needs to be strengthened. That needs to be the government focus, not politicizing the epidemic and talking about something else. This is all the time we have for NewsClick today. Do keep watching NewsClick and do visit our website. Thank <laughs> you.